Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start the recording. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world you're joining us from. Um, it's very early in the morning for our speaker today and it's almost bedtime for me. So <laughs> we have the whole <laughs> range of, of time zones here. Um, a very warm welcome to everyone to the second talk in our um, uh, fall series, fall webinar series. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my name is uh, Bidisha Banerjee. Uh, I am uh, leading this project called Fanatic Ethics with uh, two uh, colleagues, Judith Misrahi Barak and uh, Thomas Lacroix. Um, I think many of you know them. Um, so uh, please do look us up, um, uh, our website. Uh, we are uh, planning a number of, this is kind of the first part of the, of the project because of the pandemic, we're having these webinars. We were planning on having, um, you know, a number of face-to-face -face events, which we have postponed for now, but we are definitely going ahead with the plans. Um, so we have two workshops, one in Montpellier in uh, late March, early April, uh, and another workshop in Hong Kong at my university, the first one, the first workshop in Pilar's university and the second one in mine in September. Uh, and then we uh, finish off this phase of the project uh, in December of 2021 uh, with a conference in uh, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, so if you're interested um, in, uh, more interested in the, in the project and uh, interested in finding out about it, do uh, get in touch with us, uh, look us up, um, and uh, uh, we will uh, continue to have uh, these talks. So we have, uh, we're planning a winter series starting, uh, which will uh, feature talks in January and February, and then a spring one, hopefully as well. Um, we did have one more talk scheduled for the fall series for December 4th, uh, which we had announced, but unfortunately uh, we are going to have to cancel that because the speaker um, is in um, Senegal, is it? I think so, Thomas, yes. Uh, and uh, he, yeah, and he doesn't have access to a very reliable uh, internet there. Um, so we decided to, uh, to postpone that. Oh, he's here. Um, I had you. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Sorry for the convenience. No worries. No worries. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Yeah. So we will Pleasure. definitely have you later on. Um, we hope to. We hope to. Um, March. March. Have you? Yeah. Mm. In March. Yes. Um, okay. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Judith to introduce our speaker uh, for today. Yes, yeah, so most of you or some of you are probably familiar with uh, Shrilata's name and um, her work, but I still want to say a few, um, you know, a few sentences in order to be able to have the pleasure uh, mm -hmm. to introduce her. So she's Professor of Francophone Literatures and Cultures at the Campus Saint-Jean, which is a Francophone uh, campus that is part of the University of Alberta. And she's also the director of uh, Imelda. So this is the Institut Marcel et Louis Desrochers pour le patrimoine et les recherches transdisciplinaires en francophonie canadienne et internationale. So I had to read that because it's... You know. <laughs> uh, so she, you probably um, are aware also that she has lived and worked and taught in many countries before joining the University of Alberta. I mean, something like 10 years ago. I believe, I mean, India, uh, Mauritius, Singapore, Australia. And she has published extensively on comparative French and Francophone, post-colonial literary and cultural studies, diaspora studies, island literatures, uh, Indian Ocean cultures, French Canadian topics as well. She's also written on sports, uh, on translation. And I want to mention, of course, I couldn't miss that. Uh, I want to mention the book we co-edited together. So that is translating the post-colonial in multilingual contexts uh, back in 2017. And that's part of the Poker Pages uh, series I ran. And in fact, last time I heard Sri Lata speak, it was in Kolkata for the, for the Ecotones uh, series. And I'm again, very happy to take this opportunity to announce that the 
the latest volume also of Poker Pages is just uh, out. Uh, and it's within our theme um, as well, because it's borders, borders and ecotones in the Indian Ocean, cultural and literary perspectives. And it was co-edited by uh, two colleagues who are also part of this Thanatic Ethics uh, project, Marcus Arnold and uh, Corinne Dubois. So it has a selection of uh, uh, two conferences in Calcutta and University, uh, University de la Réunion. So um, uh, I'll, I'll put the link um, up. And so before Calcutta, it was in Montpellier that I heard uh, Shrilata speak for the last time. And the talk I remember is, um, was Impossible Returns, Diasporic Traveling Back Narratives. So I'm looking forward to hearing Sri Lata uh, follow up, in fact, on that uh, in today's talk in the different context of the data ethics, uh, but still in the context of the Indian Ocean. So it's always a pleasure to interact with you, Sri Lata, and uh, we're delighted to have uh, to have you on board as well as part of the uh, the Natic Ethic projects and also as a project team member on the on the project. And thank you for having accepted to. Uh, participate in this webinar. So floor is yours. Thank you, Judith. Um, I'm just going to do the share screen thing here. So um, is that working? Yeah, I think it should. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And good morning, good day, good evening. Uh, as um, Vidisha pointed out, it's about 630 in the morning here in, in, in Canada. So I'm bright and cheerful. And um, uh, first, uh, thank you, Judith, for that very generous introduction. And thank you to Toma, Bidisha, and Judith for making me a part of this Thanatic uh, Ethics project. And in, it's a real pleasure to be here um, to talk on this um, topic of um, uh, migration. So the, the title of today's topic is Invisible Bodies, Refugees, Under documented migrants and asylum seekers in Canadian literature. Am I loud enough? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so in an article that I published in the Canadian Review of Comparative Literature uh, in May of this year, I proposed a transnational reading of uh, refugee fiction and argued that the geopolitical conjunct conjunctures highlighted by the juxtaposition of texts from different literary um, landscapes and traditions on irregular migrations has the potential to shed new light on each of these individual texts. And one of the interesting observations that I made uh, while I was writing up this paper was, but on which I didn't expand, uh, was how these texts consciously reflected on the bordered or refugeed subject as an ambivalent construction at the intersection of multiple and concurrent narratives. So in this presentation, I explore this idea of refugeeness through a reading of what I'm gonna define as refugee fiction written by Canadian authors within the frame of Canada's self-proclaimed image as a model embodiment of, I quote, a history of refuge. Now, if you visit Canada's official immigration and um, citizenship website, under refugees and asylum, you'll find a page entitled Canada, a history of refuge. And as you navigate through this virtual gallery of refugees, welcome from all over the world since the time of the Quakers fleeing the American Revolution in the 1770s to the Black Loyalists in 1780-89, the Jewish and Ukrainian refugees in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, to asylum seekers from Latin America and Africa in the mid 20th century, the Indo-Chinese boat people after the fall of Saigon in 1975, right up to the 2015-16 successful Syrian refugee program, you will also notice on the same page references to the significance of the Canadian Bill of Rights, 1960, the Canadian Charter of Rights, 1982, and the Immigration Act, 1976. All these are legal frames which form the basis of core Canadian values of multiculturalism and diversity. And um, if you remember in June, January 2017, um, when Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, tweeted, and I quote, to those fleeing persecution, terror, and war, Canadians will welcome you. 
regardless of your faith. Diversity is our strength. Hashtag welcome to Canada, end of quote. Now he was verbalizing a Canadianness that is modeled on compassionate hospitality to all. That being said, like everywhere else in the world, in Canada, public opinion on refugees, asylum seekers, and the undocumented migrants oscillates between two opposing positions, what um, Sanyal calls humanitarian compassion and securitarian anxiety. So while in general, it seems that Canadians feel that their work with refugees and migration is one of their key global contributions, Studies have shown that Canada's welcoming immigration policy is in fact underpinned by very diligently maintained border walls. Three of these walls fortunately happen to be geographical. So the Atlantic, the Pacific and the Arctic oceans. With notable exceptions, as we will see in the course of this talk, Canada hardly receives asylum applications at seaports. The fourth wall is Canada's southern border with the US. Uh, with the exception of the last four years, for the obvious reasons, historically, the movement has been towards south of the Canadian border and not in the reverse direction. The fifth wall is a bureaucratic barrier that Canadian governments, whether they have been conservative or liberal, have very fastidiously constructed and maintained. So in reality, uh, it is believed that Canada spends more resources than most people actually realize on deflecting potential, potential asylum seekers. And as has been pointed out in some studies on refugees in Canada, the bordering of bodies that enter Canadian space is done remotely, extraterritorially. People don't notice it. It doesn't have the visible violence, violence of border policing at geographical frontiers that you would see in Europe, for example. So while man, many Canadians may claim that Canada is already going above and beyond the call of duty in assisting people refugeed by conflicts that are taking place elsewhere in the world, Canada has used several deflection tactics and it's not as facile or easy as one thinks for refugees who are in danger of their lives to get a visa from a Canadian immigration officer overseas. Masked also by Canada's reputation of the model welcoming nation is another long history that of Canadian hostility towards people trying to break through these border walls, really. Right from the famous incident of the Komagata Maru in 1914 to 2009 and 2010, when two ships carrying about 560 refugee claimants from Sri Lanka were intercepted off the coast of British Columbia, and whose uh, their arrival had the government, the media, and quite a, a number of Canadians in an uproar. One cannot also forget another inglorious moment in Canadian history in early 1942, when the Canadian government detained and dispossessed 20,000 Japanese Canadians already living in British Columbia. And um, well, they were invisibilized under the War Measures Act and were interned for the rest of the Second World War. Now, so when the book, um, I'm just gonna... So when The Illegal um, by Lawrence Hill was published around the time of the Syrian crisis, its Canadian author Lawrence Hill, better known for his book called The Book of Negroes, uh, reached out to the Canadian public to say that, and I quote, we should open our doors much more widely. We have lots of room in our economy and a geography for more people and for more refugees, end of quote. There may have been several Canadians who may have been taken aback UNHCR now estimates there are about 1.4 million refugees in need of resettlement, and these projections continue to increase every day. Canada's moment of generosity on the Syrian front is a mere drop in the bucket, and Lawrence Hill's call for a humanitarian response, despite securitarian anxiety, was and remains timely. The Canadian also believed that his novel could inspire readers to care more deeply and empathize more profoundly with millions of people in the world who are, I quote, stateless in, or in hiding or undocumented, which in turn would make us demand, he says, more of ourselves and, I quote, will also demand more of our elected officials, end of quote. Indeed, literature employs our imagination and our empathy to help us overcome the social and cultural barriers constructed by divisive and nationalist politics. 
Investigating the direct impact of such novels on a country's refugee policy is probably not feasible, but investigating how refugeeness is represented in imaginative literature can go a long way in challenging some of the dominant narratives on refugee crises, on refugee resilience, and in influencing political will. So I'm interested to see how far Canadian texts, these creative Canadian stories, go to challenge Canadian celebrations of refugee resilience, because that is precisely what is celebrated on the Canadian website. I also asked the question, is the literary refugee a mere aesthetic signifier to render the invisible visible to a curious readership? Or do these representations go far enough um, to interrogate the very foundations of the legal, political, and social categories that are used to label um, these irregular uh, or um, regularized aliens within inverted commas? So as some of you may know, Canada honors its multicultural identity by periodically awarding the country's prestigious literary awards to works that celebrate refuge and immigrant resilience. Last week, Laotian Canadian Suvankam Tamavangsa received the very prestigious 2020 Scotiabank Giller Prize for portraying, and I quote from the jury's um, um, jury, the immigrant experience in achingly beautiful prose. And she got this prize for her stories, which are, I quote again, vessels of hope, of hurt, of rejection, of loss, and of finding one's footing in a new and strange land, end of quote. Ironically, the writers themselves may not represent themselves or their works in this manner. An acclaimed Vietnamese Canadian writer, Kim Thuy, and winner of the Governor General's Award for her French language novel, Rue in 2009, has denied very vehemently that she writes immigrant stories. She's a Vietnamese refugee whose family arrived in Montreal when she was 10 under the Indo-Chinese Refugee Resettlement Program. Her fiction is based on the Thuy family experiences in Vietnam, on boats, in refugee camps, in Canada and, and in Quebec. As a creative writer, she highlights the difference between refugee and immigrant, a definition that I find very useful when making that distinction between immigrant writing and refugee fiction for the purposes of this paper. And I quote from her interview, refugee and immigrant are very different. A refugee is someone ejected from his or her past, who has no future, whose present is totally empty of meaning. In a refugee camp, you live outside of time. You don't know when you're going to eat, let alone when you're going to get out of there. And you're also outside of space because the camp is no man's land. To be a human being, you have to be part of something. The first time that we got an official piece of paper from Canada, my whole family stared at it. Until then, we were stateless, part of nothing." End of quote. So refugee fiction mediates between presentation and representation to subvert, question, or simply call our attention to how a certain kind of refugeeness needs to be told or performed to obtain that official piece of paper. Refugee fiction, as I define it, is more nuanced than the narrativization of resilience and of, quoting from the jury, finding one's footing in a strange land nor is it merely documenting the undocumented. Besides the usual media accounts, and you will find numerous websites and personal homepages that have posts of refugee stories, many of them first-hand accounts. I have chosen specifically to work with creative fiction because a novel provides the textual space to reveal the telling of these stories in their multidimensionality and the reception of these stories in their multi-contextuality. Refugee fiction, I believe, brings together and mediates between the multiple narrative strands that constitute what is conventionally perceived as a unidimensional refugee subject. One who is, and I quote from 
um, one, of the, one of the refugee writings online. One who's supposed to fill the shoes of this person called the victim and which this person decries is a full-time job and a non-stop act, end of quote. In his book, Rethinking Refugees Beyond the State of Emergency, Peter Nyers observes that defining the refugee subject is an ambiguous exercise because how refugees are perceived is not just the domain of legislative and judicial sectors. And I quote, he says, the politics of being a refugee has as much to do with the cultural expectations of certain qualities and behaviors that are demonstrative of authentic refugeeness, example, silence, passivity, victim mode, as it does with legal definitions and regulations, end of quote. Trish Luker in Performance Anxieties, Interpolation of the Refugee Subject in Law, also points out that the refugee emerges in, and I quote, a performative speech act, which is a result of repetition and citation of tropes of refugees, which function to legitimate and naturalize certain representations as evidence of the grounds for protection, end of quote. So central to the construction of refugees is the importance of providing a good, and I quote from the, one of the novels that I'm referring to here, a compelling narrative. This compelling narrative has to be coherent and credible refugee story, a story that warrants and justifies a protective response. So in the case of Canada, what happens is asylum speaker, seekers make a refugee claim in Canada at a port of entry or at an inland office, which could be the Canada Border Security Agency office or the Immigration Refugee and Citizenship uh, Office. What they call resettled refugees, on the other hand, are screened abroad and undergo security and medical checks prior to being issued a visa to come uh, to, come to Canada. People who are intercepted, the irregular border crossers who are intercepted by the RCMP or local law enforcement after crossing the border irregularly are brought to the nearest CBSC port of entry or inland CBSC, CBSA office, whichever is the closest, and where an officer conducts an immigrant examination, including considering whether detention is warranted. Now, if the claim for asylum is determined to be eligible, it is referred again to the Refugee Protection Division of the Immigration and Refugee Board, which is called the IRB, for a hearing. When CBSA or the Canada Border Services Agency detains a person and that person is not released, the ID, the Immigration Department must review the grounds for det detention and decide whether there's reason under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act to continue detention. So the ID is supposed to carry out a review within 48 hours of the start of detention. Based on the evidence and the testimony of both parties, that is the claimant and the, the, the detaining party, the immigration department may order the release of the person with or without conditions or order continued detention. In most cases, it's continued detention. So this whole process of refugee determination is at the heart of Sharon Bala's novel called The Boat People, um, published in 2018. And the centerpiece of Canada's refugee determination process is an oral hearing before the Refugee Protection Division of the Immigration Refugee Board. And this, uh, this um, bureaucratic process takes center stage in the novel as well. And that's what it makes it very interesting. These oral hearings before the RPD allow members, that is the jury, the officials, to gauge the claimant's demeanor. And I, um, and I um, underline that the claimant's demeanor, so the appear appearance, physical and verbal, and the consistency, plausibility, and coherence of their story. This process is not simply about recognizing who is a genuine refugee 
or who is not based on concrete evidence that is identity papers, et cetera, or a certain historical knowledge of the conflicts happening elsewhere. As Trish Luker has argued, and as I have uh, already um, stated above, I repeat, the refugee emerges in this performative speech act as a result of repetition and citation of tropes of refugeeness, which function to legitimate and naturalize certain representation only as evidence of the grounds for protection, end of quote. So what Sharon Bala's novel reveals is that this speech act, first and foremost, um, is based on um, um, what she calls a capricious law, and which also places these claimants in certain um, absurd and um, inauthentic situations. The system demands the performance of authenticity, but in order to make the narrative recognizable and understandable according to the norms of the legal process, the singularity and possibly the authenticity of the account may be lost. And I quote um, from Sharon Bala's novel, detention reviews, the admissibility hearing, then the refugee board hearing, a long series of judgments each an opportunity for failure and deportation. Lemons Mahindan, who is the protagonist of the novel, who has had 12 failed detention reviews. Coached and encouraged by his lawyers, he remains, however, confident that he would eventually tell the judge, and I quote, a good and compelling story and pass this hearing, end of quote. So it is the legal process and its demand for qualities like consistency and a credible demeanor that the society and, and, and the societal expectations of what a victim should look like uh, that, brings, uh, that, that brings into being the refugee. Since the claimant's personal narrative is usually the primary piece of evidence available to decision makers, the refugee hearing then becomes a prime opportunity for a claimant's performance of refugeeness. The individual faced with the authoritative power of law recognizes the call as an address to him or to her, and in an attempt to make him or herself recognizable, responds with this compelling, but not necessarily the real narrative account of his life. So Mahindan, who is this Sri Lankan um, asylum claimant, his own story of resistance, resilience, and survival in LTTE-held LTTE northern Sri Lanka is told in flashbacks as he waits in this bureaucratic limbo of admissibility hearings and detention reviews. But the compelling story he would have to tell would be to prove his credibility before performing his refugeeness in such a way as to allay that securitarian anxiety that has been generated by the narrative, that circulating narrative in, 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 in society, that um, Tamil, Tamil tigers uh, had, also had also boarded the same boat and that they were also part of this um, uh, group of uh, asylum claimants. So even if there is no direct evidence, circumstantial evidence connected him connects him to the LTTE because of his professional training as mechanic. And historically, there is that whole connection of um, um, bombs, um, uh, buses being bombed, and, uh, and, and the, the mechanical expertise that uh, was required uh, for performing these uh, suicidal acts. So the novel, The Boat People, demonstrates how a capricious law and a disbelieving and a fearful society create refugee sub subjectivity through a process, which is this administrative hearing, which exists, and I quote from uh, the observation made by the young lawyer in the novel, um, in the fuzzy boundary between bureaucracy and law, end of quote. Some critics of the novel uh, some critics of Sharon Bala's writing, in effect, felt that the only interesting character was that of Mahindan's wife, Chitra, who died in childbirth in Sri Lanka. Well, that is the irony, isn't it? Her story, which is integral to Mahindan's subjectivity, will be left out in the compelling story of refugeeness. And, um, and because 
that is not the story that's going to justify a warrant um, protective and, and eventually protection and eventually his statehood. Chitra dies in childhood, uh, sorry, in childbirth, and Mahendran has brought up his son on his own in the LTT hell conflict zone of Kilinochi. The, flash, the flashbacks tell a poignant tale of love, toughness, and difficult choices made in the face of adversity in Sri Lanka. But in keeping with discursive space provided in the Canadian context, he will have to learn, he'll have to be coached to relate a convincing and compelling good refugee victim story. The novel both people's narrative structure that intertwines the legal, the political, the social, the psychological, exposes the discourses that construct refugeeness and underlines how performing refugeeness is ironically not about authenticity. Giving voice to Mahindan also blurs the lines that define victimhood in the times of conflict. The novel also subverts the image of Canada as a model humanitarian host. And I quote um, again from the young lawyer's observations in the novel. These people have fled a prison camp to come here, locking women and children with actual criminals is insane. Locking the asylum seekers with criminals is inhumane, inhumane, end of quote. The inhumanity of the detention process is perceived to the story of Priya, who's a second generation Tamil Sri Lankan Canadian, who's drawn into representing Mahindan and a handful of other claimants who are from the ship. While the third storyline, very interestingly, belongs to a third generation Japanese Canadian, Grace Nakamura, whose grandmother had been interned during World War II, and she is one of the educators who will determine the destiny of Mahindan. So Canada's story of delegitimizing its own citizen looms large in this courtroom where decisions are being made about legitimizing uh, the presence of non-citizens. In principle, immigrant detention is just a temporary stage for those who are about to be deported. Indefinite detention, which is unfortunately the, the norm or the reality is grounded on arbitrariness and unpredictability on an obscure bureaucratic maze. And I don't have it's the, the time here, but there are in several examples in the text about uh, uh, that reflects this, um, this the, the arbitrariness and the capriciousness of this law. Uh, what the novel also brings out is that, and the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy that underpins asylum requests is based in a system of um, disbelief and uh, which is visible in the asylum procedures and present throughout the detention, where endless interrogations force refugees to relive traumatic experiences of fear, loss, and torture time and again, only to encounter skepticism and disdain. The and another interesting thing also is this performance of refugeeness is almost always mediated by an interpreter in the admission hearings. And um, refugee story is the most important part of their claim. It will be told and retold often through the voice of another person. At one point, Mahinda, not having stayed there for one year, has learned to communicate in English, but his, uh, his lawyers tell him that, no, it's, it's, it's probably important that he continues to speak and talk in Tamil, and the interpreter will be doing the exercise of, of translating. This gap between the expected authentic story and the lived authentic story and how the text, the novel, the fictional space mediates between the two is what is at the heart, I believe, of refugee fiction. The detention center, whether it's a detention center or whether it's the camp in the case of the other novelists or the slum in the case of Lauren Silk, I'll come to that. These are non-spaces of waiting where one lives out of, out of the body, out of time and out of place. And it is in this vacuum that the stateless are called upon to perform their refugeeness. So if Sharon Bala uses textual realism, multiple narrative voices and historical flashbacks to deconstruct the discourse on refugeeness, and question Canada's celebratory discourse or celebratory history of refuge, Lawrence Hill um, uses satire and parody to call into question the refugeeness that is constructed out of the conventional expectations of trauma, resilience, and survival. In the, in the novel, The Illegal, which is translated also into French as sans papier, which is also an interesting um, uh, this, that would be another paper to talk about translations. Um, Lawrence Hill invents two fictional countries, Zantoro land and Freedom State in the Indian Ocean, and sets his plot in the near future in 2018. The book was published in 2015. 
It is also very um, interesting to know that this temporal proximity to the time of writing contrasts with the geographical distance of these invented countries from Canada, from, from the place of publication. Does this intriguing choice of fictitious spaces so far removed from Canadian realities underline the author's desire to discuss the globality of the question? Or is it just to stay clear of an overt criticism of the Canadian government? Well, I'll leave the question open here. The protagonist of the novel, Kita Ali, is a citizen of Santoro land. He's an elite marathon runner. And following his father's death uh, at the hands of corrupt government agents, Kita has, doesn't have any other option but to flee. Arriving in this prosperous neighboring country state of, which is called the freedom state, to participate in a marathon, he separates from his agent and goes underground, finding refuge in Africa town, which is an immense shanty town where the boundaries between the regular and the irregular, between the legal and the illegal are blurred at all levels. So at first, first glance, Hill's account appears to align with mainstream discourse on global migration defined either from an economist uh, perspective or from a humanitarian vision. That is that of a resilient illegal immigrant fleeing persecution in his country of origin who will succeed and make a better legitimate life for him in, the, in his country of refuge, thanks to his running skills. But Hill's irony works at two levels in deconstructing the dominant discourses about undocumented uh, migrants. On one hand, Hill criticizes the way in which the black body is reduced to its athletic prowess and draws our attention to the fact that the global movement of athletic bodies only strengthens the systems of control and surveillance of the movements of black bodies in the world. On the other hand, it's this athletic body of his protagonist, which is Kita's most uh, strongest weapon and becomes the empowering key to performing his refugeeness differently, more authentically. Hill presents us with a near futuristic dystopian space shaped by grotesque characters who operate in comedic situations. Mixing farce and suspense, the novel The Illegal offers us a satirical representation of the political and social context in which the drama of undocumented migrants and asylum seekers play out. And what, even if Kita Ali is the illegal of the title, Hill's story undermines this ambiguous legal and social political category through the character of Lula Di Stefano. And um, uh, Lula Di Stefano in the novel is Africa Town's ruthless hostess. And we will learn at the very end in the ultimate ironical twist that this fierce woman, fierce and fearful woman who is a gangster who's a protector on, uh, and who controls the fate of senior politicians, is herself an illegal and originally from Zantoro land. So it is through irony and parody that the author undermines the construction of political and legal category, uh, the, the, those legal categories, illegal, undocumented, irregular, uh, et cetera. And to, uh, to kind of, um, um, respond to that question about whether he's staying clear of an overt criticism of the a a Canadian government. Uh, this the Africa Afric town, which is at the center of the illegal, actually um, uh, refers obliquely to Africa Ville, it's, which is a, a black community north of Halifax in Canada. So the, 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 the references to the Canadian situations are, are, are present, but very obliquely. So Hill's near futuristic narrative set in a fictitious country may be an effective reminder that state produced non-citizens are also present in Canada and that Canadians have to grapple with this reality. That there are other stories about Canada that are different than the welcoming liberal narrative. So if Canadian literature needs to be inclusive and needs to be an inclusive literary and political project, it must also come to terms with the reality that non-citizens denied the usual human and social rights associated with citizenship also constitute a state-produced feature of the Canadian landscape, as we see in uh, Sharon Bo Bala's Boat People. 
for as the poet Patrick Chamoiseau say, states, and I quote from a, a, an article um, that he that was written, translated in, 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 uh, in 2018, we live not in a state, a nation, a federation or confederation, surely not in a constellation of commercial hyperplaces and financial centers, but in an ecological and human, human totality extremely reactive, sensitive, and unpredictable, end of quote. Fictional narratives that relate forced and irregular migrations disclose how performances of refugees reproduce bordering by dividing these performances into successful and failed speech acts. As some, however, succeed in blurring their boundaries, some of these, and this is, what, um, uh, and this is why I refer to um, uh, Kim Tui's success as a refugee writer. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with Kim Tui's works, and I've just, she has written, Rue was her first novel for which she won the Governor General's Award and then subs which was translated into several languages into English. And then uh, V is one of her latest novels, but she has this amazing public persona as well that has also contributed to a success. And, and she has been accepted very, very gracefully by the, by the Canadian public. And it was, well, it was last year, was it that her rule was, was actually uh, um, proclaim the, the, the most popular novel in Canada the, or the most widely read novel in Canada. Her public success rests partly on the picture that she appears to have projected in this book, Rue, of a nurturing and inclusive Canada that she presents, which of, of obviously aligns very neatly with the official state multiculturalism policy. But as she has uh, but but this uh, the reason why I've kept this to the very last. There's so much work already written about Rue, she, and it has been argued that um, this dominant trope of gratitude, which seems to be the the, the most um, apparent one in the text, is not uniquely directed towards the Canadian state, but also at other refugees and survivors. And that's that's a nuance that she provides in the text. And um, and which is lost in in ironically uh, in the in the in the in the extreme simple um, and lyrical prose that she she produces within the frame of refugee performance. I would argue that Thuy subverts the um, the official speech act of refugees by rewriting the rules of refugee performance. If gratitude is written into her text. It is to call into question the performance as key to the good refugee narrative. And what she does in the text is exposes the interstices between the coherent performances of refugees. So her text is a series of vignettes um, and uh, that kind of alternate between uh, uh, anecdotes that um, refer to uh, to violence and, um, and 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 to abjection and uh, uh, and other anecdotes and, and vignettes that uh, refer to uh, uh, scenes of pleasure, scenes of comfort, scenes of security, and um, the, the 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 connection is lyrical and not always um, rationally uh, coherent from the point of view of um, the coherence and credibility that was expected of in a refugee narrative. Um, by reinterpreting what has been interpreted, she takes back her story. The simplicity of a prose proposes a counter subjectivity to one that has been imposed on her for her to get that official piece of paper. Uh, Thuy's college collage like style, and it's, it's, uh, critics have talked about her. her um, her bricolage um, as, um, as her literary strategy. Rue incorporates vignettes of prose poems that jump from one page to the next, from one story to another, mixing uh, different stories. And um, the first person voice occupies that interstitial space where the legal, and I, this is where I quote, the legal designation of refugee has dissolved but a sense of being refugeed still lingers. I end my presentation 
with a quote from Paul Ricca who says, literature never ceases to challenge our way of reading history and praxis. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, I'm putting my mic back on. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful talk, uh, as we could have um, expected, of course, coming from you. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of um, a lot of, of, of questions and uh, comments to share, either on the chat or if you can put your videos on. Uh, that would be, you know, that would be lovely. Just think of uh, putting your mics uh, on. You know, for, for a very odd and fleeting moment. Um, I had the impression, you know, at one stage towards the end of your talk that we had invited you as part of the Ecotones mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, project because what you were saying about, um, you know, the detention, I mean, detention center and the non-place, um, as well, uh, that was called upon, in fact, by fiction, uh, so that the characters actually can exercise, you know, their, what you have called refugee-ness in those uh, non-places or ecotodes or uh, heterotopia. It was, um, maybe it is something that you could, you know, respond to uh, as well. I mean, this notion of ecotones, and I know, you know, you've been part of the, of the project. Yeah. How, how does that bear, you know, any significance in this, uh, thematic ethics, you know, hmm. project, and um, you know, particularly in relation uh, to Africa Town and the detention centers uh, that the novels are uh, uh, talking about. Yeah, actually, it's, uh, while I was writing this paper, and and, and I, I realized there is that connection because when you're talking about um, the space, the the in this particular piece, I was trying to look at that um, idea of performance, idea of narrative itself and how it gets mediated. And in this process of mediation, I mean, so there is, there is the, the act of mediation, there's the instance of mediation and, and there is the space of mediation, right? So, and, and, um, and you, you realize through the course of the, of, of, of the interaction of these, of, these, of these different elements that in effect, in effect, um, the, the uh, an ethics is, can, can only be produced in the interstices. Mm. And that's the connection that I'm making between the two projects. And um, in effect, uh, so when you're looking at the, you, the, the motive of death, the motive of, is also linked to the motive of, of, of invisibility. So um, in the case of, and, and, and there I bring it also to the question of authenticity, because in the case, like in the example of mind and story, the death of, uh, of Chitra is elsewhere, but he's unable, to, unable to, to carry that with him. In his performance of, of, of uh, authenticity, certain aspects of authenticity that's linked to his memories of death. And so that body is kind of, um, is, is invisibilized twice, is killed off twice. And, 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 uh, and so there, there, are, there are various ideas here. And, I, and, uh, and, and at some point I would really like to just work on that, on, on the concept of the performance of, of refugeeness, which becomes a performance that, that, that in effect kills any form of authenticity and um, authenticity of, of death, authenticity of, um, um, of, of bodily subjectivities. Mm. I hope I answered your question. It's, it's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm just looking at it, but the, there are several examples that I could draw from, from Rue, um, uh, from the boat people, and also from, um, uh, Kim Tui's new novel, The V, um, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, could, you, could you give us yes? Could you give us a few a few examples, and particularly in the context of uh, the dead body of the refugee, for instance, or um, yeah. You know, I'm thinking of some of the other some of the other works you have you have worked on. I mean, uh, Tropique de la Violence, for instance, by uh, yeah. Also, yeah, and, when and, you have 
you have ghost, you know, voices and you have ghost mm. uh, characters that come back and where you you do not have anymore. I mean, it's the, the, the body that is both dead and alive and uh, those mm -hmm. borders are also blurred. I mean, in Apana, it's very clear. It's, a, it's very, yeah, absolutely, it's very clear. But there again, it's, it's also the question of, um, well, is how how is but for the for for the, for death to occur, there has to be a body. Mm. So when the body is not recognized, <laughs> how do you define that? So there is that is that there is that point as well, and that in effect in effect also underlines these narratives that look at um, those uh, instances of of individuals who are not documented, not recognized, who are not there. They're not just invisible, they're invisible in all senses of the word. So I, I, it'd be interesting actually to define the de dead or define that which is not there against that which is not there. You see the paradox. And I think in these kind of fictions where, and that, that's exactly what Kim Tree says, is one is out of place, one is out of time. And um, so how does one define those uh, binaries as life and death in that kind of situation. It's still, I mean, and, and I think what, what for me, when I define these, these, these novels, because there are, there, are, there are several other novels that I could have worked on, I found these texts useful because they actually called into question or raised those kind of ambiguities. Without, of course, resolving them. I mean, that's not that's not yes. uh, the yeah. I'm also looking at the um, uh, at the chat, and so if people want to put in, you know, questions on the chat, or simply put their uh, switch their mics on and and their videos. Pilar has or a question. Hi, Pilar. Pilar has a question. She has her hand raised. <laughs> Hi, Pilar. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, um, hello, everyone, and hello, Sri Lata. Can you Hi, hear me? Pilar. I can hear you. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Yeah. You can't see me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can oh, we well, see you? I can see you. No, no, no. I, I just have to scroll <laughs> down. Sorry. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'll here. See you. Okay. I'll see you eventually. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Very nice to meet you online like this. Um, I have a comment and a question. Uh, yeah. My comment has to do with uh, what you've been discussing about the need for the refugee to perform an authentic and a uh, credible uh, narrative, uh, this narrative of the good um, refugee. And yeah. I was wondering if, if you're familiar with the text, uh, which sort of challenges that narrative as well, which is the, um, it's a short story cycle by Wade Compton called uh, The Outer Harbour published around the same time, maybe 2015, 2016. And the first of the stories um, features a stowaway that cannot be processed through immigration services because mm. she speaks a language no one can understand. It's mm -hmm. absolutely impossible to identify what language she's speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no interpreter that they can find. And also, you know, there's this need to categorize and classify people according mm -hmm. to how we look. Mm -hmm. And she's vaguely Asian, but nobody can tell really whether she is East Asian or South Asian mm -hmm. or what part mm -hmm. of the world she actually may come from. So there is no way, they also don't know where exactly she got on the ship. So what can they do with that? You know, how, and, mm. and so there's a kind of challenge to these narratives that classify every human being mm -hmm. according to certain uh, preordained and, you know, pre, uh, well, previous categories. So that's, that's I think, a very interesting way of, of looking at it. And, but my question has to do with form. You've been touching on how each of these narratives is different how Bala is a lot more realistic in her approach, mm. whereas Lawrence Hill, as usual, because it's what he does in every mm -hmm. single mm -hmm. uh, work of fiction, yeah. likes to be sort of, um, what he provides is sort of feel-good mm. narratives, like mm. there's a very happy ending at the, t at the end, and you know, the good are rewarded and, and the bad are punished, uh, whereas in Bala there's no way 
there's no happy ending at all. Mm. Mm. I mean, she doesn't really provide an ending, but mm. we get the impression that there is no happy ending and happy reunion at the end for mm. this man and his son. Mm. Mm. Um, and, and so I was wondering about whether you think there is a particular form or style mm. that you would think fits better with this need for authenticity. Uh, mm. And so if we provide a realistic text or if we face a realistic novel, are we, mm. from a reception point of view, more likely to believe in mm. that authenticity, to position ourselves closer to mm. uh, that refugee uh, subjectivity or not? Mm. Do you think form has an impact mm -hmm. on how we, um, um, how we perceive our relation to these uh, human beings that are suspended, uh, uh, no longer part yeah. of the flow of time of a, a specific um, a place and so on? What do you think? I would very, I'm very interested to hear what you think. Uh, you thank you, Pilar. Answer. Thank you for your first for that um, for for Ray Compton's uh, reference, and thank you for this wonderful question because. Uh, while I, and this is I, I, I'm I, I, I love I love working on form and um, and I and I, I, I and especially when it's when it's when when the when the form itself is questioning its form it's the narrative is questioning the narrative so uh, and and your whether whether the, the the and I've taken here in effect three different types of forms um, all of which question the 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 legal or the social act of performing refugeeness. And Lawrence, as you rightly said, Hill provides a satire. Uh, Rue provides lyrical prose. Um, it's like a um, poem, poem on prose. As in the, it's, it's, a, it's a poetic prose. And Sharon Bala is realistic, a novel. And I find that in the, in the, the even if Sharon Bala's novel is realistic, it, it, it kind of taps into all those resources that fiction as a polyphonic space provides. So it provides a different, and, and I think, um, whereas the Rue's novel, which I was, uh, which, which I teach and I find very difficult to teach because it's so, even it's so intricate, seems to have had a huger impact and this is uh, in term and 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 uh, and of course the illegal. Um, not very many people have read it. Even people who are fans of Lawrence Hill. So it's uh, and what I thought was the most difficult text seems to have had the greatest uh, impact uh, on um, well on, on the reading public. Now whether that impact is because there is this this um, this theme of gratitude that runs through the text is something that um, that has always been a subject of de debate in the discussion of, an, in, of her novel, of her work. And, um, and it's that people read um, at the first level and they, they seem to have had got it. Sharon Bala's no novel, I mean, from, from the responses you get, I mean, not very many people outside of people interested in such literature would have read it. Uh, it has been acclaimed as a popular novel, but as you know, in, in, there is, um, uh, but in terms of form, I, to respond more, more precise, more um, directly to your question, I'm not, I don't think there is a particular form. And I find that each of these texts have responded in particular ways. Now, what it's it's how do you measure the impact is something that on the reading public is something that I don't know is possible. Can uh, in terms of it can you can have a, a in terms of a, an immediate impact on policy, for example. Can you measure that? I don't think so. But one can in in terms of whether it raises um, one's awareness, um, whether um, a, a person like, uh, you know, a person who prefers reading a realist novel, will that person be able to actually understand um, um, all those kind of intercultural um, elements that are in Sharon Bala's novel? 
for example, all those flashbacks back to LTT, all that Tamil culture, which is not always evident. Mm -hmm. Whereas in, in, in uh, Kim Thuy's novel, one of the reasons why it gets very easily um, absorbed by the reading public is, uh, is the very minimalist approach. So I, I can't, I mean, uh, so there is no direct answer to your question, Pilar, but it is an interesting, um, interesting topic to discuss. And, um, it, and it also, I think, largely depends on um, the kind of marketing these books have had. Thank you. Thank you, Srilata. I appreciate that. It's, these are questions I'm thinking through my yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just to, to, to mention that, uh, yeah, your, your presentation resonates quite a lot with the uh, work which has been done on the, uh, on, um, on asylum requests uh, or asylum claiming in France and in other countries in Europe, especially the, the role, you, you didn't, you just mentioned it in, in passing, but the role of the interpret, interpreters. Mm -hmm. It's very important, and yeah. and you have to see uh, research which has been done on the, on the interpreters and how they they tend to to transform the narrative of mm -hmm. the of the refugees uh, in a, in a way that they think it would work with with the uh, with the uh, those who assess the, the claim. So can you let us more about where, how, how it's addressed in the in the in the books? No, no. I I. I, find, I, I think that that question of the interpreter is a whole whole paper by itself. That's the reason yeah. why I didn't go into it. And not just the, the because it, I wanted to play it at two levels because uh, interpretation is happening in the novel is as mediation is happening in, in, the, in that hearings room, the room, but also in terms of the writing itself, the writer who's writing and mediating between the narrator in the text and all the different narrators. But, and that is a metaphor also for for the kind of filtering that's happening in the creation of that performance of uh, refugeeness, and and in in the novel um, Mahindan, as I said, wants to express in his tale and his his uh, his story in English at the end because he doesn't have confidence in the interpreter. And mm -hmm. also, what's very interesting in the novel is that there is a an objective interpreter at the hearings, so. And that interpreter is a, a blonde Canadian man speaking Tamil. Um, and, and the choice is also very interesting. And, and it doesn't, the book doesn't tell very much about it. And I want, and, and I, I really want to explore that. Um, because normally, and um, you have these NGOs and community organizations that provide interpreters. And there is there was one person standing. I mean, in the novel, there's there's an individual called Charlie who's wait Charlika who's waiting to be the interpreter, but she's not called. And uh, so there is a filter there. So the who who the, who gets to being the interpreter? Mm -hmm. And and how does one know that that who else but the claimant knows whether the interpretation is right or not? Because if nobody else is speaking that language, and that's why the question and uh, and. Why is the claimant not allowed to speak for himself or herself? And uh, in the novel, that was what, what's also very interesting because there are several cases that are detailed. There's one particular uh, Sri Lankan who, who, is, who has a better command of, in the English language because he's a journalist. And um, as a journalist, he, he's, he's also in possession of a different kind of rhetoric and different kind of discourse. And he's able to perform that himself. And, uh, and he gets passed through the hearings. It's interesting that too, but in the case of Mindan, he doesn't speak English at all when he arrives. And uh, he's literally a captive of that interpreter. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and throughout the novel, there are these very, very um, poignant passages when um, initially Mahindan is looking at the interpreter and doesn't understand what the interpreter is saying. And 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 uh, and then so, so there is this whole this this question of um, hearing itself the absurdity of the situation because who is hearing it's mm -hmm. and because only some can 
possess that boost, uh, not just the authority, but also the linguistic competency to hear. And, it, and there is, um, there's actually a French writer, Shumona Sinha uh, of yeah. Indian origin, who's written mm -hmm. a whole book on that, um, Assommons les pauvres, mm -hmm. um, where yeah. she actually retells, the, uh, re recounts her experiences as an interpreter. Yeah, very Bangladeshi, controversial. Very controversial <laughs> Bangladeshi immigrants in France. Uh, yeah. And there is, and there is also, um, I mean, we can, you know, speaking about that crucial uh, figure of the interpreter, yeah. uh, there is also that film uh, by Virginie Sauveur, uh, Le Temps des Égarés, oh, that wow. also has, you know, the interpreter. And so it's quite close. I mean, there is, you know, manipulation as well. And uh, so yeah. in many ways, it can be compared with um, uh, Assommons les pauvres by uh, Shomona Sinha. And I would also mention the, the novel by um, Marie-Célie Agnon, Le Livre des Mains. So yeah. it's, not in a, it's not in a refugee context, but it, it yeah. is in a migration context. And it's, mm. uh, again, wonderful if you're, you mm. know, if you're interested in, uh, in that figure mm. of the interpreter. I mean, it's definitely mm. something to uh, mm. remember. Mm. But, but what I find very uh, also revealing is that the way in which these writers themselves make that distinction between, you know, migrant writing and refugee writing. And I, and I want to really look at that because uh, the, the, there is this whole celebratory um, reading of migrant writing, of, you know, hybrid writing and saying that, new, but, but whereas I think the distinction and as Kim Thuy rightly makes and is that in refugee writing, there is this writing about nothingness. It's, it's not, it's, 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 it's the, in the, how does one write the, 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 um, the inability, those in, it's much more difficult um, to, to write that, that um, uh, to, to inauthenticate a performance that authenticated them. You know, mm. um, and that mm. is something that is very specific. And that's what I call, and I'm trying to develop that idea of ref refugee fiction from that perspective. Mm. Can I talk again? If I can jump in again, um, going back yes. to the idea of the interpreter as someone who filters these narratives, I find that. Bala also makes clear that all these testimonials are also filtered through our own lived experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that point is made through, um, uh, you mentioned her name, Grace Nakamura, yeah. uh, who's the one who has to decide whether uh, Mahinder's mm -hmm. claim is actually uh, credible. Mm -hmm. um, you would think or you would expect that because she comes from Japanese Canadian background and her mm -hmm. own family, mm -hmm. uh, her grand, her mother mm -hmm. uh, who lives with her lived through um, haunting experiences mm -hmm. uh, through the, during the internment, you would think that she would be particularly mm -hmm. uh, sympathetic to the plight mm -hmm. of these people, but it's actually the opposite. She feels mm -hmm. extremely vulnerable. She feels that people will think that she's biased mm -hmm. in favor of the claimants. And so it actually works against them. So I think she really makes a fascinating point about how we can filter all mm -hmm. those lived experiences through our own lived experiences and how the result is quite unpredictable really. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And that's why I find Sharon Bala's novel so interesting, because uh, she, it's not, not that she's, it's not that she's filling her pages with, you know, Canadian multicultural subjects, but it's also the choice and, and the, the fact, and this really would happen. And, um, and what it means, uh, and, and, and that distinction within the same, that intergenerational uh, kind of tensions within the same family. Uh, and it's through the it's through those tensions that she is she has to make that judgment. So in that yes. so again in that room in, 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 in that space, which is not the detention space, the space where judgment is going to be made is is, is also a space that has those ghosts of uh, of Can yes. Canada's inhospitable past, and that is also an irony that is um, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely that 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 is played out in the in the text. And, and that's why it's a very yeah, rich text. 
Absolutely, I I I, did, I discovered it, um, you know, just by chance, like like the illegal, and um, and and I'm really glad I found it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pilar. Is there anyone? Um... Yeah, I, I have a question. Sister Walter, I thought it was a very interesting talk, but I, I, I was interested in the way in which um, uh, Lawrence Hill's um, narrative seemed to seem to almost uh, have links to um, Colson Whitehead's Underground Railroad in its terms of uh, wanting to think about these things in terms of almost like a kind of science fictionized kind of narrative. Mm -hmm. And also the way in which um, uh, it seemed to be sort of almost uniquely Canadian in terms of the kind of idea of uh, runaway runaway slaves being underneath it, in that sense of uh, Canada being the salvational place, and hmm. and then and and Africa Town and, and that kind of idea of uh, of the, 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 these transformational spaces like that. So. Maybe, maybe there's there's a sense in which it it's an outlier in in some ways. Yeah, thank you for that that reference. And I think uh, the, I found the text. I mean, I'm not I'm not a um, um, in in terms of rich in that it uh, for somebody who's in Canadian literature, there are, there are several intertextual references, and uh, which would make another another reading. Uh, of the text very possible and um but i've always been with that intrigued yes it's it takes on that very science fiction era it's very um kind of um frame but it was interesting that his invented in countries are in the indian ocean hmm. um which is well it's and and to some extent um, in another text, I did make that comparison that it could be he would maybe thinking of those um, um, those irregular irregular migrations in the Indian Ocean between um, between Mayotte and, uh, and 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 the and, and and the Comoran archipelago uh, is Freedom State South Africa. One one it, there are, there are several um, ways in which um, one could make those kind of connections with. With, with the pan-African um, uh, um, cultural landscape. And um, absolutely, but uh, the question of, of running and the question of, of, of the, there's a, there's a whole, I think there's a whole um, reading to be done in terms of um, that, that, um, uh, that, that the African connection, um, African mobilities and how that's represented in Canadian literature. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I can add to that question. Yeah. Um, I think a closer reference for Lawrence Hill is his earlier novel, Any Known Blood, which is actually about the Underground Railroad. Yeah. Uh, you may know that his parents came from the United States. Mm -hmm. And in that particular novel from 1997, Any Known Blood, he actually traces back the history of his own ancestry mm -hmm. uh, in the US and the runaway slaves and so on. Uh, and there's actually one character, one recurrent character throughout three of his novels. The first one, Some Great Thing, 1992. Mm -hmm. The second one, um, Any Known Blood, uh, 1997, was a journalist from Africa called Yoyo, who reappears in the illegal as father to the That's protagonist, right. Peter Ali. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's like a running thread there uh, that goes way back. And I don't think it can be connected to Whitehead's uh, novel, which mm -hmm. I think is fantastic. But still, I yeah. think he has his own references and, and background that you need to mm -hmm. look at. Yeah, no, he's it, that's a whole hill universe um, yes. out there, um, and the um, yeah, absolutely. There's the, there's this total another angle that can be looked at. Thank you for that.
But the other interesting thing too, to cut out that <laughs> Hill is never considered, he's a, he's a Canadian author. He, uh, he's not, whereas Tui and Bala are of, often categorized as immigrant writers or refugee writers. And, and I didn't want, and I wanted to put them all together in a way that, you know, and to look at the text um, first, and then, you know, eventually look at their, uh, their literary, their personal literary landscapes. Um, but it, it, it's, it is interesting, and to go back to the question that Pilar asked whether about the form and, you know, what, the impact that illegal as a, as a, as a novel about um, Undo the undocumented and compared to some um, Bala's novel about the undocumented, I mean, which would have a greater impact to the Canadian public. That would be an interesting discussion um, in terms of who has a right to talk about these people. And, and that's, that's a big question in, 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 in the Canadian um, academic space. And um, that also is something that can be addressed, but um, because it comes with this whole question of authenticity and where the you're looking at um, who can who has a right to, to mediate refugee stories um, I don't have the answer to this but then as I was writing this and I did these things came to me came to mind and uh, um, yeah We lost our hosts. Judith, ton micro, si tu veux parler. Judith, you're muted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, we've been very regular in, in the kind of, you know, time slot um, that we've been using, kind of, you know, an hour and 50 minutes or so. Um, but is there any, any other... Um, no comment or question or anything that would that you would like to share or um, but we'd like to you know, thank you again I mean Trilata it was it was wonderful and thank you for your questions and for um, uh, the comments that were attached. Um, Bidisha did you want to add something or close or uh, no not really thank you thanks again Shilata. that was really uh, that, yeah thank you yeah thank you for the opportunity Actually, uh, i wanted to ask you something you know oh sure, sure. yeah uh, it, it's 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 pure ignorance on my part huh? okay so because you know uh, I, you i mean you came across this word governor general's award you know so yeah. it's it sounds a bit like you know a kind of a state sponsored award like so it was fascinating to see that you know like so many i mean you, you see i mean you know like these books are they're calling into question uh, government stand uh, towards okay. immigrant refugees and on the other hand they are getting like you no know, government governor general <laughs> award uh, so maybe i don't don't know what exactly this governor general award stands for uh, like you know what exactly it is Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, she, um, Prix Gouverneur General pour la fiction en français. That's what she got because of her. Was of, and it's given, it's, it's actually a very good question because, and one of the reasons why she, if she does, uh, uh, the, the book is so publicly appreciated is that for some reason, people only read it at one level. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, and the kind of questioning and the kind of the, the, the complexities that are hidden behind this apparent simplicity of the lyrical prose is lost. So in that sense, but also the, uh, remember the name is Gouverneur General, but then the people who are actually educating for the, yeah. who, who evaluate those questions are uh, uh, intelligent <laughs> people who kind of understand, I guess, the importance of producing literature that also as uh, which which challenge reality so yeah and um, it's it is just an it's a name for in in, in English Canada you have the Scotia Giller prize and other other prizes but you also there is it's it's a it's a traditional thing you have a governor general's award because do not forget that Canada it, it's it, we are still 
under the crown somewhere. <laughs> so the governor general and the queen, you know, the royalty that forms very much part of the cultural landscape. Um, they are invisible but invisible around us. Great, great, great. Thank you. Oh. Okay. So uh, thank you very much to everyone. Thanks a lot. And we look forward to seeing you again on some of the yeah. other you know, forthcoming uh, yeah, seminars, the, webinars online, and uh, we'll be communicating yeah, about those. Yeah, yeah sure. The, 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 the following one, as mentioned by Bidisha, has been cancelled, but uh, we are um, the uh, we have on the 29th of January, Juliette Closiu will talk about the Tajiks in Rus Russia and the way they take care of their dead in the context of the, of the COVID pandemic. <clears throat> yeah, so we are looking forward to, to seeing you again in, in January. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you very Bye. much to all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Sri Lata will be in touch. Huh? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, bye.